All right. I switch into Loom for this one because this, this is a really interesting uh, discussion. Um, all right. So Justin, I don't know who that is, but <laughs> I don't know who any of these people are, but that's why Twitter is great. Um, so he just chiming in to say that what we're talking about here is simply the connectivity of our content, which is a tiny piece of our overall tech. The bigger picture of the tech is covered in more detail here. And I clicked that link and this is why I got really intrigued. Um, so they've got, so basically they've got the knowledge graph, they got all the nodes. Um, okay. So you can, you can imagine, you could imagine it scattered, but because of the tree conjecture, we know, we know that any knowledge graph can be represented as trees. We know tree notation is all you need for that. So we can imagine the knowledge graph as a very long file, um, using the offside rule, using indent. Okay. So you got that file. What topics are in there? Um, so this is so this is really cool. So then they have the students model, and they overlay them on the knowledge graph. So they're looking at the intersection of those, figure out what topics the student knows and how well they know it. So we know also tree conjecture. We know the student's knowledge graph can be represented as a tree. We can represent it as a long, single long file, uh, and then we overlay those two files. Got the knowledge graph. Got the students model. Um, and then the diagnostic algorithm. So, I mean, come on, it's a simple thing. Leverages the knowledge graph to minimize the number of questions. Oh, well, actually, no, that's pretty cool. So you're, mini you're minimizing the number of questions needed to estimate a student's knowledge profile. I mean, basically, we're just seeing what exists in the knowledge graph that doesn't exist in the student's, um, student's file. What exists in the, we'll just call the knowledge graph the knowledge file. The knowledge file, what exists in the knowledge file that doesn't exist in the student's file. Um, and you know, if we, I'm assuming they've got enough signal, they've got enough good measurements in that knowledge file to indicate the importance of each line of that file. And so then we can say, not only what is the student not know, cause no one knows all this stuff, but what are the, but show me the things the student doesn't know ranked by importance. So that'd be, that's pretty cool. I mean, I don't think we need to call it the diagnostic algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just a, it's a simple concept, but the task selection algorithm takes students to use it to determine the optimal learning task that will move the needle of students learning. Yeah, sure. It's, it's just, you're just sorting. You're just sorting. You're just saying, here's everything we know collectively. The whole world knows in the knowledge graph, single file. Um, here's everything student knows, the student's knowledge graph, single file. Um, what are the important things the student doesn't know? So what is the, what is the diff of these two files? And then sort by importance, and that's your that's your so so it's so it's good it's it's we're spot on we're in agreement with that all the also the content itself full length adaptive lesson for every single topic in the graph which all the students are now for blah 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 so not just selling the equivalent you see here it's a lot more than that well no <laughs> um. You got to look at scroll sets. So check out scroll sets. Read the papers. Um, so so this is um, actually you're going to want to read this. Um, so you're going to want to read this paper. Um, basically, it tells you about scroll notation. So this is 2017. It's that the fact that it's all you need. Um, and then we created parsers, which is a language on top of that for making languages. We give you, it allows you to count complexity and, and, you know, the idea is how do you make things as simple as possible? Well, you've got to remove every keystroke that's not necessary. Uh, what happens when you do that? And then you, you get to the point where we have scroll sets, a new way to store knowledge. Um, and so, so basically this is just the simplest way. I mean, you can't make it simpler if you could. I, I don't even know how, but, but maybe you could, um, I'm always open to that. And then once you get it, like I said, it becomes your, your algorithms become real simple. We're just saying knowledge graph, collective knowledge graph contributed by everyone around the world. So, so PLDB, sure. It's a CSV file, but it's really a single giant scroll file. Um, so, I mean, I can show you the source code. You can take a look yourself, drill into here go into the concepts folder. So, so, so basically this is our knowledge graph and it's split up by files, but, um, you know, 
we b before we built that CSV file, all we do is we can concatenate all of these files into a single file, into a single two hundred thousand line file. Um, so this is all of our this is our knowledge graph on C. This is our entry on C, um, and so we get a lot of information on C. Obviously, it's an important language. Um, so we have five thousand files. Those are all concatenated, and that's that's our knowledge graph. And then for me, because I reviewed every one of these files over seven years, uh, or ten years, or I don't know how many years, um, there's my my knowledge graph and this knowledge graph overlaps quite a lot. If you take me fifteen years ago, I'd probably knew like six things. So it'd be like tiny, and then and then you can optimize your learning algorithm. So I think it's the same. I, I like the way you phrased it, um, but um, but I don't think I think it's I think less is more actually I think I think less is more. Um, no, you can knock my work. I don't care. <laughs> I people have been knocking my work for years, and that's how it gets better. If you if you see flaws, knock it. Call it shit. I don't care. Um, it's great. Um, Da, 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 da. I mean, you can do it. Wait, no, it's not. It's just this isn't this isn't accurate. It's not accurate. Oh, of course, we can all co coexist. I mean, you know, you guys should use scroll. Like, I've got other things going on. Like, <laughs> it'd save you a lot of. It would really enable you to go to the next level. Um, cool. Anyway. I, I think you did a really good job of, of clarifying um, um, the, this um, this thing. I think there's a simpler way to put it, but uh, I think yeah, we're, we're I think we're pretty much on the same page. Um, cool, good good stuff. So yeah, I suggest I would I would highly suggest going full open source public domain. You could do an early release. Um, what the hell was it? called? Early source early source software um, where you say okay we're gonna um, we're gonna have a private repo you can pay for that one and you get you get the greatest stuff a year ahead of time everyone else gets the public domain version of, of a year or two ago uh, so that's a good that's a good hybrid between um, open source and closed source it's like because then most people because most people are not going to be your power users and um, so they'll, they'll just get the free old version and then the power users who really depend on it can pay for the, the early source version. So that's what I would recommend. And then you can benefit from, what the hell is it, ETA. Um, basically, because if your ideas are not open source, they're not public domain, they're gonna evolve slower and they're gonna go extinct because you're gonna compete, you're gonna have to be competing against the open source public domain folks. So. Better to just get in the get in the front now, be a leader of an open source public domain project, rather than wait around to someone else who's going to come in and and figure out this map as well and, and and take the lead. Anyway, my two cents, take it or leave it. But really interesting stuff. Thank you for the response, and have a great day. Cheers.